Hello everyone officially and welcome to our event on how can openness find its, find its place in the Data Act. My name is Paula Grzegorzewska and I am OFE Strategic Partnerships Director. So I'm very happy to have such a great panel of speakers with us today uh, because they have quite different perspectives and quite different experiences that they, can, that they can share with us on the influence, the challenges and the opportunities that the Data Act is posing or will pose in the future. So with us today, we have uh, Pierre Chastanet, who is uh, head of cloud and software unit at the European Commission. And uh, just a small uh, asterisk here, Pierre will have to leave us uh, at 5 p.m. sharp because of other commitments. So if you have questions to Pierre, uh, please write them in the chat throughout the, the duration of the event till, till 5 p.m. Um, then we have with us Anita Shaw, who is IP law counsel at uh, IBM. We have Clark Parsons, who is a managing director at the Internet Economy Foundation. Welcome, Clark. Uh, we also have Frank Karliczek, who is the CEO of Nextcloud. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we have Astor Numelin Karberg, who is the executive director of OFE and who will provide introductory remarks for this event. So for those who don't know us, Open Forum Europe is a Brussels-based think tank working at the intersection of open technologies and public policy. But I assume that most of you know us. Um, and first, just a bit of housekeeping. Our events are meant to provide a space for an open exchange and, you know, to just have thought provoking ideas and discussions. Uh, so we will have a Q and A part of the, of this session uh, starting at five. Um, all our events are covered by our community participation guidelines that you can consult on our website. And I will also drop the link uh, in the chat. Um, and as I said, you can write your questions in the chat and some of them will be picked up during the Q and A section, but our speakers also have access to the chat. So, you know, they're able to see if there is anything that they would like to talk about or address while they speak. Um, and as you, uh, as you see, this event is recorded and the recording will be shared on our website and our social media. And of course, for those who couldn't make it today. Um, as I mentioned, we will start with introductory remarks by Astor and then move to the panel with our speakers and finalize with the Q&A session. So please, Astor, the floor is yours. Yes, and let's hope that my sound works and everything. I did like six tests, but this should be good. Well, thank you everyone for being here and extra special thank you for the panelists, of course, participating. Uh, so yeah, just to contextualize a little bit from OFE's perspective, um, well, obviously, just a couple of weeks ago, the reason why we're here today, um, the Data Act was uh, Data Act proposal was published from the European Commission, and uh, the goal, in many ways, is uh, of this file is to create uh, fairness in the data economy by addressing the challenges of access and use of data in specific situations, including B two B and B two G contexts. So, uh, as I said, you know. I said that this was the first OFE event on this file. That is because we, of course, expect there to be a few more as the the, um, uh, the file progresses through the legislative process. But then again, you know, seen from a different perspective, first might also be kind of the, the wrong way of seeing it uh, because the events on the data economy and uh, the cloud market for more than 10 years now. And actually when preparing these remarks, uh, we took a moment and revisited uh, the related events and projects we've organized or been part of over these 10 years. And I think uh, some terms like the free flow of data directive and SWIPO might bring up some of you back to these past efforts and things that you yourselves have been engaged in. Um, and the angle that OFE has taken on the question of the, the data economy and uh, has often been through the lens of the cloud market. Um, we have, you know, welcomed uh, the emergence of, of this big, massive global economy um, and also the move towards cloud solutions. In many ways, important for Europe, uh, this setup can offer numerous advantages such as decreased costs, higher flexibility, efficiency, security. Um, and from our perspective, something we talked a lot about is especially in kind of flexible hybrid cloud environments. Um, and it's, it's true of the DNA of our think tank, the recurrent focus in some ways, kind of the red thread through these events and projects uh, uh, has been uh, interoperability or perhaps uh, uh, the lack of cloud interoperability. Um, but so why interoperability? Um, well, we see it on the one hand, 
the lack of interoperability on uh, on the one hand as a barrier to 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 cloud computing uptake because uh, vendors fear vendor lock-in or uh, users fear if you're a vendor lock-in uh, but it's also an example of where, where uh, network effects are at play um, uh, with certain winner take all dynamics uh, of the market and in our view, lock-in, it's interoperability's antithesis. Um, it leads to situations uh, that once an organization has selected a cloud provider, uh, either it cannot move to, to another provider or it will incur substantial costs in doing so. This is either because of economic or technical, uh, the economic or technical offer has become inadequate or because the vendor has ceased operations. But this lack of interoperability creates rigidity in the market from the user perspective. And from our view, you know, the common mechanism for enabling this uh, interoperability is the use of open standards. This is, as many of you probably know, one of OFE's focus areas and it's close to our hearts. And another important context for, for the Data Act and uh, for today's event, perhaps the most important aspect is that cloud infra infrastructure services are, are fast becoming the de facto operating systems of modern life and work. Uh, increased market concentration in this field uh, results in consumers, businesses, and public administrations ending up tied to expensive, inflexible products that they cannot leave because their data is locked in or there are no serious alternatives. Technology in a network market always risks this, this market concentration. And uh, one when a vendor can leverage its advantage before the environment can adapt. So, you know, looking at the situation and the data act and where we're at today uh, through the lens of history, uh, what we've discussed for the past 10 years is that, that a policy environment supports competition by leveraging interoperability and open standards has proven to be a decisive tool for public good. And from this historical lens, it was interesting just to go back yeah, and, and kind of see the questions we've discussed in the past. Um, um, you know, uh, things I found was uh, what can we learn from past technology driven market concentration? What policy options should policymakers consider? Should the European continue its course of self regulation? They will have the data act. This will be interesting to touch on. Should the Commission consider focusing on setting incentives for competition or proposed legislation on interoperability? We'll get to this also with the data act. It's quite interesting. Um, and I think. It almost goes without saying that our activities at OFEs and the discussions we've been part in uh, uh, have generally been responses to the focus that the European Commission and the member states have had on the competitiveness of the Cloud Act. The Data Act is not just doesn't just didn't just pop up from somewhere. There's been a lot of work on this uh, in the past, um, and it's you know we're excited to to get into the new Data Act, especially now when revisiting all these past. Uh, 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 activities. Uh, this is a very in important and interesting point in this history um, and our 10 years of engagement. So yeah, we will now hear from our speakers. Um, and of course, there is a big focus on interoperability in the new Data Act, but uh, there's a lot more to it as well. Uh, I don't want our past activities to kind of limit the scope of today's event in any way. And that's why we're excited, excited to have, have a panelist with a very different perspective uh, of, uh, on this file. But I've already spoken too long and I've dwell, you know, been dwelling on past activities. So I hope the panelists and our moderator, Paula, uh, can take us into the now and into the future and give us a deep dive into the Data Act and the role of openness in it. So thank you very much and thank you speakers and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, so thank you, Astor. And uh, let's move to the panel uh, part of the event. And uh, actually, Astor talked quite a bit of, about our past activities. Um, so it's a it's a good uh, switch to my first question to the first speaker, uh, because actually back in September 2019, we hosted an event on uh, competition in the cloud, and we had both Pierre and Clark join us. Um, and Clark presented his report that uh, that they wrote. Um, at the time. So I would like to hear your perspective, Clark, on the current problems in the cloud market and how do you think it has changed and how do you think it can change with the Data Act and what problem does it address? Super. Thank you, Paula. And uh, also thanks uh, to Astor and Paula and Julia uh, for the invitation. Um, it is a pleasure to be back with the Open Forum. You're, you guys do a wonderful job of uh, 
of putting the, uh, these issues on the table, and um, we're really delighted to be uh, to be here again. Um, <clears throat> Internet Economy Foundation. For those who don't know, we are a little think tank in Berlin, uh, working for uh, Europe's digital future. We are, in fact, not funded by any of the giant companies that are often running around Brussels funding people. I just have to get that out there. Um, so we really are fighting for the European ecosystem. I think it's important to say that um, uh, up front. Um, you mentioned, Paula, our study in 2019. We put out a study because if you could boil the Internet Economy Foundation down to one word, it's usually competition. We really think that if Europe is going to succeed, uh, it can't just regulate its way to a world-class uh, tech ecosystem. It really has to compete. Uh, and as a result, we find ourselves looking to Brussels for a lot of these pieces of legislation like the Data Act, um, Digital Markets Act and others, uh, because we just think it's so important to get uh, to get the rules of competition and engagement right. So in 2019, we did this study because we were looking at the growth of the cloud market, the explosive growth of the cloud market continues to grow explosively. Um, and what we saw was um, something relatively scary. And we really wanted to actually alert everybody um, uh, to, to uh, market dominance that we saw was happening uh, at the infrastructure layer. One of the things we did in our study that I think maybe is pertinent for those <clears throat> who, who didn't see it, that I think is really helpful for everyone to give some terms of debate, is we, we, we drew a pyramid and said all cloud is not the same. Um, for, the, for the sake of debate and how we thought about the market, we really wanted to try and draw some distinctions because not all cloud services are the same. Uh, and so we drew three layers and we sort of said at the bottom of this pyramid is the infrastructure layer. This is the layer where if I had a startup 20 years ago and I was paying just for servers and engineers, now I just, you know, um, uh, hire Amazon Web Services or Google or many of the other providers at the, at the infrastructure layer. And that's completely taken care of. It's, it's a godsend for the startup ecosystem. It cuts costs. It raises efficiency. It's fantastic. The problem we saw in 2019 was actually that Amazon Web Service, who all but created that market, were running away with it. Uh, it was really threatening to become an absolute monopoly at the time. Um, I think those growth rates, uh, or rather, uh, those uh, relationships have, have somewhat solidified. They've, they've not run away with the market. There is still competition. Happy to see IBM still here with us uh, on the market. Uh, but Google and IBM and Microsoft and others have made investments in the tens of billions just to compete in that market. On top of that um, is sitting, of course, what we said was the platform layer, where there's a lot more providers, it's more competitive. Um, you know, we have great providers even from Europe. I mean, Frank Karliczek and Nextcloud do a lot of these kind of services also on top of the infrastructure layer. Um, and, um, and we see that as, as, let's say, not as threatened by monopolization, if you will. Um, but still, it's, it's important to, to keep that distinction. There's uh, how important it is also in the platform level not to lock yourself in. Um, and then atop that, we said was, you know, software layer, software as a service, which is massively competitive, usually. I mean, most of us have a choice of tons of vendors for different softwares. That's not often as much of a problem. The one caveat we said, and the point, the reason we did this study was, as many of us know in technology, uh, if you're a lower layer, it's very easy to move up and eliminate your competition. And that was our that was our warning that if uh, if somebody dominated the infrastructure layer, they could just move up the value chain and pretty soon eliminate all their platform competition and even some you know some software competition. So that was the thrust of the study, um, uh, and and you know so our main recommendations were things like please governments be aware of uh, the lock-in effect um, and 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 ensure that that. Um, that there's legislation and behavior uh, in the marketplace that really uh, does not let a monopolist take charge. So I, I dare say years later, um, what's changed, Paula? I think there's an awareness now of this. Uh, we've seen projects like Gaia X, where Europe really has been trying to put uh, kind of a federated system together um, of interoperability, of openness, of, of best of breed solutions, you know, being uh, offering a lot of choice for uh, for, for consumers and others. But I mean, if I could give one more thought um, before I, I, I turn it over, I'd say, you know, as you said, the goal of the act is to improve uh, data sharing and create this data market. Uh, and one of the things that the IEF has, of course, been very um, alarmist about is the fact that we have monopolies in, in some sectors of consumer data. We have 
you know, really giant market dominant players. It's the reason why we have a Digital Markets Act hopefully taking shape. Um, it's also a reason why the DMA does include cloud computing services uh, in its definition of core platform services. So there's some overlap here. We might find ourselves talking about several pieces of legislation, but they all kind of work together uh, or should work together, we hope, um, in that the Digital Markets Act knows what the Data Act is doing and vice versa uh, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. Um, because, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of things that we've seen in the debate about how the Digital Markets Act can can right some of these wrongs, being very specific and not too generalist, um, that we can really think about when we look uh, at the Data Act. Uh, and I can maybe get to some of that later, but I, I think it's just really important. You know, Frank Karliczek might remember just only about a half a year ago, the German government, after all of these warnings, was about to essentially hire Microsoft Azure for a gigantic lock-in for much of the whole government. Uh, and, and a lot of people had to scream and say, are you kidding? I mean, it's the ultimate lock-in uh, uh, with a non-European player here. So um, awareness is one thing, but it hasn't necessarily trickled down to all the purchasing departments. Um, so I, I think, you know, uh, unfortunately, the market conditions that we were warning about in 2019 are to some degree still there, but I think the awareness is there now based on these these legislations coming down the pike. So I look forward to a good discussion and uh, happy to, to go deeper on some of these issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Clark. And actually I saw Pierre uh, nodding quite a bit, uh, which is a good sign that we will jump to Pierre now, uh, because I would like to hear from your perspective, you know, Clark, uh, gave us a bit of a background, you know, how it looks in the in the cloud services market. And how do you see from your perspective, you know, what is the goal of the Data Act and will it be achieved, you know, in the in the framework of uh, what Clark has just uh, has just showed us? Okay, m many thanks, Paola. I, I do have great memories from uh, from that OFE event with uh, with Clark at uh, at that time. We could meet physically, uh, so uh, great great to be again uh, sitting together, albeit virtually, uh, in, in a panel. Uh, I would largely concur with uh, what Clark has uh, has presented on the on the market situation. Uh, just uh, illustrating from uh, from our perspective, um, since 2017, and my data are a bit outdated. We don't have yet the, the 2022 data uh, but so uh, between 2017 and uh, 2020 the, the European cloud market uh, has grown more than threefold uh, so uh, it shows the, the great development of cloud computing in, uh, in Europe it's a very healthy market it's a very dynamic uh, market um, but our concern uh, do remain, uh, as Clark pointed out, with respect to competition uh, issues. Uh, there is an increased uh, concentration on uh, the uh, lower layer of the of the pyramid. So infrastructure as a service platform as a, as a service continue uh, being dominated uh, by a few uh, large global actors. Uh, and that result in, uh, of course, the, the European uh, grown cloud service providers market share uh, declining uh, as a result so um, uh, European providers at 26 percent uh, of the of the market share in 2017 um, in 2020, they were only accounting for 16% of the Yasen Pass uh, market. Uh, so uh, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, uh, Google Cloud uh, hold uh, in 2020 more than two thirds uh, of the of the European market, and uh, it's pretty symmetric in the in the rest of the world uh, actually. Uh, when we look at uh, European provider, uh, they are the, the largest uh, European. Uh, provider, which is the system, uh, accounts for just two percent of the of the European market, and its nearest uh, follower, uh, which is uh, OVH in France, uh, accounts for about one percent uh, of uh, of market. So that's more or less the, the situation on the on the supply side. Uh, on the demand side, uh, we see uh, a continuous improvement. So uh, European enterprises continue to move toward uh, cloud technology as a key vehicle uh, of their digital transformation. Uh, the European Commission is very much promoting uh, this approach. Cloud is a key enabler for uh, any organization, public or private, if they want to do AI, blockchain, cybersecurity, big data analytics, they must move uh, into, into the cloud. They can also significantly reduce uh, their capital expenditure cost uh, 
uh, by moving into into the cloud. And this has paid off. So uh, in, in 2020, we had 36% uh, of European enterprises um, uh, using uh, cert certain categories of cloud services. Uh, in 2021, as, uh, that was up to 42% of, uh, of EU enterprises. Still big discrepancies uh, between uh, large uh, companies and, uh, and smaller ones. Also uh, some differences between um, uh, some member states, notably Scandinavian countries that are much more advanced uh, and uh, more uh, southern uh, eastern uh, member states uh, where there is a um, uh, catch up to, to be done. So nevertheless, it's, uh, it's uh, progressing uh, quite, uh, quite well in, uh, in that respect. So uh, maybe uh, making the linkage to uh, to the data act, and uh, as Clark mentioned, the, the, the DMA. Let me uh, also mention this uh, shortly. Um, we have a key concern on uh, the degree of vertical integration of uh, some of these large uh, global service providers, and unfortunately, the the, the pyramid uh, does not have uh, the. the uh, the layers are well defined. Unfortunately, they are not distinct uh, in the way uh, providers are offering their services uh, to, to the market. And increasingly, uh, this is offered as a, a bundled uh, offering, therefore, therefore uh, cutting uh, some providers out of the, of the market when those providers are operating uh, in just one uh, layer of, uh, of the pyramid. So the degree of vertical integration is a, is a key uh, problem. So of course, we're going to try to address this uh, via the, the DMA through the identification of, uh, of gatekeepers uh, that will be uh, subject to specific and more stringent uh, rules in that respect through the, the Digital uh, Market Act. So let me reassure you there in the, in the first place, uh, this has been very well articulated. Uh, we had uh, hours and hours of discussion internally uh, to make sure there was a very clear uh, carve out and um, the two of them really integrate like two pieces of a, of a puzzle. Uh, we made uh, sure of, uh, of this. So no overlap, really full complementarity between the DMA and uh, the data. Now, with respect to, to uh, concentration and, uh, and market uh, fluidity, um, uh, we saw already uh, in the free flow of non-personal data regulation, we gave uh, industry the opportunity to address the issue of uh, vendor uh, lock-in. Uh, through uh, self-regulatory codes of conduct. Uh, this unfortunately did not work uh, out as well as uh, we would have expected. We uh, could really see tensions crystallizing uh, in uh, industry around this issue of uh, vendor lock-in. And uh, subsequently, um, as the, the biggest problem arose uh, on the software as a, as a service, um, uh, we saw that interoperability aspect were uh, a key problem undermining uh, vendor locking. So as we were trying to uh, overcome uh, some of these interoperability issues to foster uh, data sharing, data access, data reuse across the European economy to foster the good development of the European data economy, uh, this was a good opportunity to bundle um, a number of requirements pertaining to cloud switching, uh, as well as uh, interoperability and, uh, and standard. So you can see that in the data act, we're really trying to uh, improve trust in uh, data processing uh, services uh, and improve uh, their performance, their fluidity for uh, users of any sector of the, of the European economy. So we have put in place a number of minimum uh, requirements in the data act to ensure uh, easier switching. Uh, between providers of, uh, of data processing uh, services uh, and uh, increase uh, interoperability uh, by facilitating, by identifying and where needed facilitating uh, the development of uh, common uh, specifications, uh, common um, uh, open technical specification uh, or uh, harmonized standard uh, to facilitate uh, this uh, interoperability. I think we'll have a chance to, to come back on, uh, on this issue. Okay. Um, thank you. And again, I think that this leads us very well um, to our next speakers because they're actually both in the industry and quite uh, quite different organizations. But, you know, you talked about both the supply and the demand uh, part of the uh, side of the market. 
Um, and of course, it's uh, it's very important how the companies themselves react to this, and of course, how it influences the influences the users. Um, so let's jump uh, let's jump to Anita. Um, and what is your experience with you know these changes that have been happening, and what challenges and opportunities you see you know from your professional and perspective on you know how it can how it can change and you know what what will be the challenge sure so again thanks for having me everyone it's great to be here with with key stakeholders and having these discussions so early on and good to hear it's going to continue um i would say uh, you know i think clark and pierre have described the the market very well i would also point to to other sources of information um, such as gartner uh, run some really great annual surveys uh, across technical fields including cloud um, i can talk a little bit about ibm and our current strategy to give you a picture as to where we are um, a few points to relay, Paula. One is that we are enterprise facing. So our customers are at that enterprise level. And pretty early on, we made a commitment to our customers. So uh, IBM's customers own their data and have control over it. The second point I want to make, and I think Asta very briefly mentioned it, is hybrid cloud. Um, moving forward, and today that is IBM's approach, it basically means that we can provide technology um, services to our customers, regardless of the particular deployment or operational model in place. So it could be you know, private cloud or public cloud, on-prem or, or some combination of them all. As well as hybrid, we also offer a multi-cloud approach, so giving our customers the choice to uh, pick between cloud vendors. So at our broadest level strategy, we are already offering portability, um, switching, and uh, interoperability, and giving our customers that full freedom of choice when it comes to implementing their cloud strategies. OK, so as well as being enterprise facing and having a hybrid and multi cloud approach, I also want to, to link into the theme of today and openness. Um, so, Paula, in terms of IBM's offerings and services across many technical fields, but also in cloud, we do leverage open technology such as open source software. Um, so a long-standing supporter, but also contributor and member of open source communities. So uh, probably more than two decades of work at foundations such as Eclipse, Linux and Apache, which continues today. Um, and for those of you who've been following us, I think that was cemented, you know, a few years ago with our acquisition of Red Hat. So Red Hat um, also enterprise facing, but wholly an open source software company and I think that really gave us you know the collaboration you know being able to leverage technology and services but also deploy our talent right in order to be able to provide customers that choice as well as open source interestingly I think tangentially to the EU Data Act um, we've also been involved in the open data communities so some early work that we did with the Linux Foundation which continues today uh, around creating a set or a suite of open data agreements trying to address the practical mechanisms and barriers to entry when it comes to data access and sharing um, hopefully we can get onto that a little bit later today um, and the fourth point I want to make is that in terms of uh, at the policy level, but also the technical and business level, we have been involved in a number of work streams in the EU that preceded the Data Act. I think SWIPO has been mentioned, um, some of the projects such as Gaia-X, um, and also related work streams such as the EU Cloud Code of Conduct, which brought in GDPR. Um, and so hopefully, you know, that gives you a high level view of not only our history, but where we are today. Um, and I will say um, in terms of some of the themes that Pierre already mentioned uh, with the Data Act, we are very much aligned when it comes to data access and sharing and really trying to unlock value in data. But also the underlying principles that seem to run through the Act around trust, transparency and openness. So glad to be part of this discussion and, and hope it continues.
Thank you. And actually, if you had to point to one challenge that you see in implementing the Data Act, you know, for, you know, not only for IBM, but, you know, for companies that will have to, you know, just sure. use the rules in place, what would you say it, it is? Um, I would say that the Data Act, uh, it, it's great, it covers many topics, but it is quite broad. So as these discussions play out and as, as the process moves through, I would love to see deeper discussions around some of the provisions uh, with our technical and business leaders um, at the table so that they can see how it's going to implement them at a practical um, on the ground level. So um, I don't know uh, if, if the audience knows my background. I'm at, Actually an attorney, ex-software developer, um, but very much advocating for my clients today uh, internally in terms of the technical and business teams. You know, how is this going to play out? Um, a few initial questions I have um, after reading the draft regulation, uh, there are many actors mentioned, um, data holders, data recipients, but also in terms of cloud, uh, GDPR, there are other entities such as data processors, data controllers. It would be good to continue these discussions to understand roles and responsibilities and how those entities intersect and interact. I think data itself is a very interesting topic. Um, in my mind, uh, there isn't really a single definition of data. Uh, data isn't all equal. And by that, I mean in terms of sensitivity, but even the technical structure and format. So again, it would be great to maybe, you know, as a team, pass through some examples as this plays out as to how uh, the provisions will impact the various data types. And by that, I mean, um, you know, business versus consumer data, personal versus non-personal, and just the many types of uh, data that we deal with, raw versus processed versus metadata. And I think this is where, you know, the legal and policy makers, we really need your help, Clark and Frank. You know, we need our technical and business teams around that table so that we can really start to pass through this as a team. Okay, thank you. And as you as you mentioned, uh, Frank, let's uh, let's jump to Frank. You know, continuing on the on the more industrial perspective, here it's a bit more on the open source SME perspective, and we are very happy to to work uh, with Nextcloud and have you here today. Um, so yeah, in your experience and in your in your view, what changes could happen, and you know, like just how it could impact your business and businesses that are similar to yours, or maybe on the other side of the spectrum as well. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I'm also very happy to be here to participate in this in this fascinating um, discussion. I think it's a, it's really important because it can hopefully has a big impact on the, on the future of Europe and the rest of the world. So first, a little bit about uh, Nextcloud. Um, so um, maybe it's helpful to um, talk a little bit about what we are doing and to clarify things because. I mean, I picked the name uh, Nextcloud. I think I uh, did a mistake because uh, we actually are not cloud. Uh, we are actually a software company that um, that provides software to our users and customers so they can uh, they can build up a cloud infrastructure for collaborating and communicating and sharing and handling of data. The, the reason for that is, of course, that uh, our mission is to create like an ecosystem and uh, a federated and distributed uh, landscape of uh, cloud infrastructure. Basically, we're trying to fight uh, the, well, like the monopolies, like the central gatekeepers um, from the big cloud companies from like, China and the US uh, and so on by giving like powerful software to everybody and they can then um, run it as they want um, um, and, and how they want. Um, and then handling that, of course, because that's obviously connected, handling their data in a way they want and they decide and that's compliant to um, to whatever they do with it. Um, our users um, are really from very tiny to very big. It really goes from someone has a Raspberry Pi at home and decides to have a cloud for their family to share their photos and have a shared calendar and something like that. Um, up to like huge service providers. I mean, there's the uh, German Telecom, um, OVH was mentioned already, several others who use our software to provide cloud infrastructure 
Um, we are also deeply involved in the Gaia X project, which was mentioned already. Gaia X, of course, also have a, has a very similar mission. This is why we are happy to be here, one of the founding members. Um, and we also provide the official collaboration platform for Gaia X because Gaia X also has the mission to create a better decentralized, uh, federated cloud market, especially in Europe which I think is very important. Um, I re it's still, um, <laughs> we still have to see how successful GAIA-X will be. There's still a lot of challenges. Um, Some were mentioned here in the chat already, but it's a definitely a good, um, a good try, basically a good um, yeah, test uh, what we can do in Europe to, to shape this market. Another thing that's really important about Nextcloud that is open source, it was also mentioned, and that you support open standards. Um, that's really um, important um, because everybody wants to look inside the software to make sure that there are no backdoors, to make sure it is compliant, and that it really does what they want, want it to do. Um, open standards are um, important for data exchange. I think we come back to this later. That's obviously absolutely important here um, uh, related to the Cloud Act because um, we want to avoid vendor logins because the Cloud Act only can have a positive impact if people are actually able to move data around um, and do what they want and share it and analyze it um, and so on. And it only works if you have open standards and open APIs. And it's also something something we do. And um, yeah, last but not least, uh, the, the final question from you, where of course, where do we see the connection to, uh, to the Cloud Act, to what we do? It's actually fascinating. I um, I um, came across this old principle uh, lately again um, from the hacker ethics. Uh, it's also like one of the principles of the of the CCC, this well-known organization, at least in Germany, and um, they basically postulated in 1984 already, like a long time ago, they already postulated that uh, make public data available, protect private data. Um, and I think this is a really important principle uh, in German. It's also, it sounds even a bit more catchy. Uh, öffentliche Daten nutzen, private Daten schützen. Um, and I think this is a really important principle because if you talk about data, it's often mixed together. It's really mixed around. And I think it's very important to have this distinction between uh, public data, maybe uh, information that comes from a government or from public organizations, they should be available as much as possible. Everybody should be able to do with them as they want, because that's the key message of the Cloud Act, um, because it um, yeah, can boost innovation and it can be beneficial for all of us. But it's totally different than private data. I'm obviously a big fan of the GDPR, which protects my private data. And this is a distinction that is, is really important. Thank you. It's actually quite interesting that uh, most of you, you know, mentioned quite some distinctions that have to be made. You know, there are different types of the cloud. There are different types of the data. There are also different type of types of industries that are going to be impacted in different types of companies. Uh, so I think this is uh, very interesting to to keep in mind. Um, thank you, Frank, for, for this. Um, and actually, we got, uh, uh, as Gaia X was mentioned a couple of times, uh, there was a question in the chat from Jonathan Sage to Clark. Um, and the question is, you know, that the main platforms are at the heart of the Gaia X. And Frank, if you want to jump in, uh, also feel free. Um, so, like, is Gaia X really creating a more competitive marketplace at the cloud infrastructure layer if all of those main platforms are in there? That's a, that's a good question, Paul. And actually, uh, I, I tip my hat to Alessio, who just below in the chat actually. Um, took a good swipe at answering the question. Um, and I would actually say I kind of agree with Alessio. I mean, I think in the beginning when people heard about the IX, they thought, OK, here comes the European Airbus of the cloud or something. Um, and then and so some people declared it dead once uh, the main hyperscalers that weren't European wanted to get involved, as they should uh, want to. Um, but I think, you know, if we've now found a golden mean of saying this is a set of standards for federated cloud infrastructure, um, to sort of ensure um, openness and interoperability because we sort of get together and agree on the way all of these systems should work together. Um, if that's all we can achieve, that's a lot. Uh, I mean, I think that's a, that's a really great way to try and 
you know, if the problem is the lock-in, then this is a great way to potentially ensure less of it. So I think in that regard, and I've, I've sat in a lot of these working group calls with Gaia X subcommittees and stuff working on, you know, really tiny corners of the Gaia X project, like AI for the financial fintech world. I mean, there's amazing amount of energy um, coming from a lot of players that are involved. So I really, I would, um, I would be remiss. I would not want to write it off right now as a, as, as sort of something that's gone awry or failed. I think we're just still trying to, we're all kind of trying to find that sweet spot of what its role can be. But I think we've, we've kind of started to find that. I'm curious to hear Frank's thoughts on that too. Yeah, very similar, very similar. I mean, uh, the approach um, is of course um, very good. There was a beginning that's exactly as you said, this idea to do this AI Airbus or cloud Airbus. Um, at the end, um, the decision was made to not create like a central um, entity like Airbus, but um, basically have uh, have this as a federated system where all cloud providers in in in, in, in Europe can build like a, a virtual hyperscaler basically. And I think this is the right approach. This is really good. Um, of course, the, the the economic sides are really interesting here to analyze because uh, the, the the vision is that. A company who wants to use some cloud services then can access this rich marketplace where they can pick and choose um, different services. Maybe they want to have some storage services, some compute services, some AI services, and they can pick it from different Gaia X providers. They can compare them. They're all interchangeable. They can also move like from one uh, service provider to another because they all use the same standards, the same APIs. So this is the idea. But um, if this really happens, I hope so. Um, this is still up in the air because there's so many things to to consider. Because I mean, if these cloud providers, and I'm include the hyperscalers here, if they would have loved to um, have open APIs and open standards and make the data free flow between them, they would have implemented on their on their own. Right? There's not. This is not a brilliant idea where the the government needs to come in and say, hey, why don't you make an open, don't, please don't open standard and say, oh, that's a good idea. And everyone has thought about that. Let's do it. That's not how it is. There are reasons. There are reasons why there is a vendor login. Right? And there are, there are reasons why they exist and that are in the business interest of some big players. And I think what's needed is actually then a big push from Europe to overcome that. And maybe this involves some, some, some legislation to force open standards on them. Okay, thank you. That's that's a very a very interesting point. And of course, you know, we will see in the upcoming years, you know, how the uptake works, and of course, what is the the final version. Um, and I think that uh, this leads us straight to Pierre. Um, you know, as you are on the on the institutional side of all this, and of course, you know, uh, we know that companies would have came up with the idea to share the data, but uh, you know, they need a, a little bit of a push. Um, so like. If you can maybe tell us a bit more how you see, you know, because interoperability is one of the key requirements and key goals, you know, that we are basically discussing right now and and that is in the data act. And so are open standards that Frank has uh, has mentioned. Um, and the data act proposal speaks of open APIs, APIs in this context and not open standards. Um, so could you, could you maybe tell us a bit more on the, on the difference and, you know, why the, the commission sees open APIs as the key for interoperability in this case? Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good, um, uh, question. And um, so a nice transition towards what Frank was, uh, was just saying, because this is exactly what we're forcing. Um, in terms of mandatory provision in the in the data act uh, to facilitate uh, interoperability so um the uh the reason we didn't use the word of an open standard very, very frankly this was throughout the draft that we prepared in the in the first place uh, and then um, it was decided to take away that uh, that terminology because it was carrying too much history uh, I think for those people who have been working on uh, on standardization issues for 
quite a number of years. Uh, they may recall um, uh, long uh, and uh, difficult debate around that terminology of open, of open standard. This is why we decided to, to retain a, a different uh, terminology. But, but what matters is uh, the effect that is uh, expected from, uh, from this. So we, we're really considering uh, two different things. Um, uh, we can have uh, open uh, technical specification uh, fostering uh, interoperability, but the Commission will use uh, the, the uh, standardization uh, regulatory framework to identify whether uh, those uh, open uh, interoperability specification have been developed in an open, inclusive, uh, transparent manner. That will be a key assessment criteria for the Commission to consider whether those uh, open specific technical specification can be included uh, in the in the Commission uh, repository. So, from this perspective, we're going to be monitoring. Uh, we're, we are already, but we will continue monitoring very closely uh, the emergence of a consensus building uh, under GAIX. We have no intention whatsoever to duplicate the, the very good work that is being done uh, under GAIX uh, already and will be happy to, to take it up if, uh, if it uh, uh, succeeds in its, uh, in its endeavor. We will uh, resume to uh, calling for standardization mandate only uh, in those cases where there is a very clear gap uh, where we see that uh, interoperability specification have not been addressed by industry uh, or that the uh, industry is so fragmented in its uh, approach that it requires uh, a more heavy ended approach, uh, in which case we will call for um, a proper for harmonized uh, standard. But in the very first place, where what we will do is uh, to, to make a landscape analysis, uh, look at what exists out there, not reinvent uh, the wheel, uh, and as much as possible rely on consensus building from from industry. This is why we're foreseeing the, the two uh, mechanisms. You know, so Article 29 uh, of Data Act, have a, have a look if you haven't done so yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and yeah, you said that uh, you would do the, the, the landscape analysis and um, which actually uh, I had a quick exchange on this with Clark that um, you know the the whole idea of data sharing, and you know that you know is is the main goal of the Data Act, and and the interoperability is going to allow many companies to innovate and you know just create new services and new products on top of existing products thanks to the data that has been shared. Um, so I was wondering um, maybe with Clark first, and then Anita, if you if you have uh, ideas on this. Uh, what are the most interesting verticals or just industries or, you know, potential products and services that might arise or emerge thanks to the increased data sharing? Um, I mean, the example that I think is usually uh, brought up is the automotive industry, because currently many car manufacturers, you know, they are sort of holding up to their data. Um, and as we know, the cars are, we even, uh, we had an event uh, back at some point uh, at OFE about the automotive industry and open source. Um, you know, cars are becoming more and more computers on wheels. Um, so, of course, we might see a, a pretty nice emergence of new services or new products that are built on top of this data. Um, Clark, do you have any, um, you know, any ideas on, on the verticals or the industries that we should look for? Thanks, Paula. That's a great question. Um, actually, to me, you know, Europe doesn't celebrate one of its great success stories recently in this kind of... Um, realm, which is PSD2, the fact that uh, in the financial world, uh, we forced open, uh, you know, we, we pried open really crusty old markets there um, by making it possible for consumers, totally consent-based, to let neobanks have access to a lot of their key banking data. And suddenly, look at this, you're leading the world in, in, in so many fintechs and has so many unicorns now creating fabulous new products and services. So um, I think Europe really shows uh, that it, when, it, when it has the guts to lead, it can really literally create whole new markets. So um, I think there's, there's so much potential here. It's really exciting. Um, to add to what you said, um, Paula, I'd say uh, cars is, is interesting. Yes, mobility. I mean, most people say Europe has really two gigantic treasure chests of data that are kind of public related that, that we can tap. And one is indeed mobility. Um, because Europe is just such a gigantic continent of public transit systems, autobahns, trains. I mean, 
nowhere on earth is there so much mobility on top of each other, intermodal, um, and it goes way beyond just Google Maps, you know, giving you real time data, of, you know, based on what other people's phones are doing. So I think mobility indeed, one I would maybe say that's really exciting is, is health. It's where Europe is also gigantic with all of its public health systems. Uh, it's probably going to be the most difficult, as Frank probably will laugh or cry when, when we remember the German health card you were supposed to get a few years ago, which essentially crashed and burned before it came out because of people worried about data protection. Um, so we're back to what Anita mentioned, you know, there's, there's data and data, there's public data, there's private data. Um, COVID, you know, we all saw the incredible value of anonymized, non-personal public health data to be used literally to steer the government um, for a couple of years now. So um, Germany is really a, a, a forward player right now with its digital health apps. I know that a lot of Europe is starting to look at this model and, and try to even start copying it. So I think if I could throw one vertical out there for discussion, I would say health is really exciting. Um, it's, it's again, it's a very tricky one because my personal health data is, you know, something I often, you know, might not even want your insurer to see. I mean, it can get really personal and can really affect your, whether you have a job or get a job or et cetera. So it can be really uh, super invasive if your personal health data gets out there and you don't want it. On the other hand, the amount of public good that can be done with anonymized public health data for cancer research, for incredible amounts of AI that you could stick on top of data sets, um, it's mind boggling. So I would really, I hope that that's a vertical that, that, you know, in two to three years, Pierre is being celebrated as one of the fathers of this great data act that's unlocked an incredible uh, amount of innovation and new unicorns in AI atop the health industry. Okay, I see that Anita uh, unmuted. I guess you have something to add on this. Yeah, just to pick up on some of the, the themes that Clark mentioned, um, we are uh, involved in a number of sectors, including automotive. And as we've been mentioning Gaia X, um, I need to also mention Catena X, which is a related pro project in the automotive sector. Um, and I would have to absolutely say artificial intelligence, um, you know, in terms of, of needing to be able to use data and, and add value on top of it in terms of our offerings and solutions. Uh, that's very critical for IBM. I would, again, as the attorney, point to some of re the related work streams in the EU that is also looking at unlocking data. For example, the copyright directive, um, you know, having the, the means to be able to have commercial text and da data mining for the first time across Europe. I think that's really going to help uh, to remain competitive with other jurisdictions where some of those copyright laws are a little bit more flexible. Um, and I think that's great to see for, for any company, regardless of size. So, yep, yeah, lots to watch, I think, in this place, Paula. Okay, thank you. Uh, Frank, Pierre, uh, Pierre, I know that you have four minutes left. So, uh, you know, if you have something um, on the verticals, because, I mean, I think it's just um, quite interesting because this is... Um, you know, something that, you know, we might actually see even on the, you know, more consumer part of the of the spectrum. So, like, do you see any verticals that uh, that you would see as the most interesting? Because actually, yeah, I mean, health uh, mentioned by Clark, I mean, this is for sure the space to look for. Yeah. Yes, um, very often when the Commission adopts a legislative proposal, uh, people only look at the, uh, at the main uh, legislative act. Uh, I would really recommend that you look at the staff working document, uh, which accompanied uh, the, the data act legislative proposal. There is a dedicated staff working document on common European data spaces. Uh, read the document, you will understand the Commission's intention and priorities in terms of data spaces. Um, uh, thank you. Um, and I'll um, have to drop out. So uh, many thanks for the invitation. Many thanks for the great discussion. And I'm sure we'll have many other opportunities to pursue the discussion with OFE and its constituency. Yeah, thanks thank you. Thank you, Pierre, for joining us today. Uh, it was it was very interesting. Um, and uh, as as Pierre is uh, is slowly slowly dropping out. Um, I was wondering if you, because of course, legislation process is not uh, 
following you know a wish list from uh, especially from industry or from the SMEs uh, but of course tries to you know just make the the market and the ecosystem a bit more uh, a bit better to innovate in and work in um, and if you had one wish or recommendation for the act that you haven't seen there uh, is there something that uh, you know you would like to see um, I see Anita nodding so maybe we start with you Sure. So again, as the attorney on the call, guys, I have to bring this back to my sphere. Um, we've talked a lot about openness today, which, um, again, hopefully with my explanation of our history and strategy, you can see that in terms of technology and services and open standards and open source, we're very much aligned. Um, I would love to continue to have discussions, though, on the legal side of this, uh, the legal instruments that will come into play as we implement. Um, so, for example, some of the provisions in the Data Act around model contracts when it comes to data sharing in certain scenarios. I think that's really positive. I mean, one thing we would say is that a barrier that we are seeing to data access and sharing or even software access and sharing at the broader level, it is the proliferation of licenses and agreements that are out there. I think that's, you know, we as a legal team could look to the open source communities, the open data communities, who've also had to cope with that proliferation, get a technical um, business, you know, legal stakeholders together in the drafting, very open in the drafting, eliciting feedback as well, in order to issue, you know, standardize um, the trend to be uh, to be short terms and conditions, licenses and agreements that can be easily read and consumed because as well as attorneys having to look at it, you know, Clark, Frank, our technical and business leaders are going to have to understand those instruments and comply. So that's one wish I have as we continue these discussions. Could we bring the theme of openness into some of the other provisions as well? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's actually, um, yeah, you mentioned the, you know, the proliferation of uh, all the different legal documents and, you know, model contracts and all of this. Uh, so I'm also quite interested in, you know, if uh, actually all of you, you know, if you if you want to, you can uh, you can just unmute so we can have a bit more of a free flowing discussion at this point. Um, but, you know, if there will be challenges with this, because, you know, of course, the Data Act has, you know, quite some noble provisions let's put it as such but uh, it might pose some issues especially to smaller companies uh, i know that there are some there are some exceptions for smes uh, but you know like we will see quite uh, quite a bit happening and quite uh, quite a quite a labyrinth to you know navigate um and do you, do you see that as uh, as a challenge uh, maybe maybe frank actually but uh, i don't you know you're quite an open company as such so uh you know quite uh, quite some of these things are already in the in the making or you know in the processes that you have yeah no i i think that's uh that's 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 really interesting i think um that we also should a little bit look look more also into practicality especially for smaller organizations and even like individuals normal citizens how to participate here um because data is one thing. <clears throat> I mean, I'm a bit repeating myself what was already discussed, but data is one thing, but you also need to have a way to actually access it and do something mm. useful with it. There's some kind of data where it's quite, quite obvious. I mean, we discussed earlier about, I don't know, video recordings of self-driving cars that are needed to do like uh, some AI uh, machine learning thing to, to train other cars. I mean, these are just videos they are probably available in normal um, codex normal standards but there are a lot of other data where it's totally not really totally unclear what to do with it how to access it what application you even need, uh, need what processing power you need to do something useful with it and then this is theoretically available but in reality not available for um, um, for the sm small and medium companies or even home users <clears throat> you of course then would think that how does a home user or a normal citizen care? I mean, what would they do with data? But that's not really the case. There's so many examples also in the open data space where uh, once uh, governments um, uh, release data about, I don't know, something. I mean, in Germany, for example, once the German train system, um, once they released like data about train connections, 
and stuff like that. Then there was so much creativity, a whole market, you could say, popped up, which used this data in interesting ways and connected it with other people. And often this is done by like one or two like developers, like students or something. There's so much creativity um, that can be um, that can be unlocked with that. But for that, it's really important that like everybody has a chance to participate here, that you don't have to be a, a huge um, organization with, with, with its own um, uh, legal department to look into contracts to access some data or that you need to have huge budgets to actually buy software which is able to process data. So, um, yeah, I really think we should look into the practicality of that. And again, sorry to say, but open standards and open source is a uh, key for that. If I could, uh, if I could echo Frank on the word practicality, I have maybe two uh, headline word wishes for those writing the act right now uh, to add to your wish list, Paola. Um, I mean, this is not the first time that Europe has gotten together very recently to draft a gigantic, all encompassing piece of, let's say, tech regulation. Um, and we've now lived with GDPR for several years. Uh, it would be kind of crazy not to have learned from some of the, let's say, um, uh, mistakes or elements that we're not happy with of GDPR. So if I could throw the two words out, one is just literally uh, easy and understandable. I mean, whether it's for the consumer or for enterprise users, I still don't know if people, uh, you know, consumers just, come on, we all visit a website and we just click, 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 click right now. Um, it's proven to be a pretty crazy and hard to understand a uh, piece of legislation, especially as Frank points out for the SMEs, pity the poor startup trying to be GDPR, wanting to be GDPR compliant, but um, having to go out and hire a lawyer to try and figure out how to do it uh, instead of focusing on building their business. And the other one, of course, as we've seen, um, cough, cough, Ireland, the word enforcement. Um, you know, if, if we get a data act that somehow ends up being balkanized in the way it's interpreted or enforced or um, how it's applied, uh, so that we end up with sort of 27 data acts, um, then we also have a problem. I mean, we're trying to harmonize here. We're trying to get a single digital market. Um, I would hope we would figure out that the way that the, the, the you know, the data act, you know, um, uh, well, the digital markets act, but also that the way the data act is interpreted, um, that we sort of you know, get it right this time and make sure that we're completely harmonized and that we, that we know what we're doing um, in terms of the way it's going to be as the Germans would say, umgesetzt, how it's going to be applied. So those are my little elements. Those are more practical elements for the wish list, but I think they're going to be super decisive in two to three years after the legislation's passed when we look back and say, how are we living with this thing? Yeah, it's interesting that you talk about the harmonization because actually, you know, we had one comment in the chat uh, asking about the AI, uh, the AI Act, which I think is for digital policy is quite separate from the Data Act, which happens rarely because, you know, you said that, you know, if the Data Act were like its provisions and the scope would be uh, put into separate 27, I think you said, files. Um, a part of it is already true, actually, when I think about it, you know, because, I mean, all of these pieces of the digital landscape are just, you know, like overflowing each other and, you know, like they, they all interact with each other. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I sort of see it as a challenge as well with the Data Act. Um, Anita, I, I just heard you, uh, you know, I, I didn't know if you want to add something to this. No, not really. I mean, I just picking up on what Frank and, and Clark are saying mm -hmm. again, you know, thinking of the folks who are at that coal mm -hmm. face and implementing this um, from a business and technical viewpoint. Um, it does look like a, at a regulation level, uh, one of the wish lists from the EU Commission is to have harmonisation across the member states. And that absolutely helps the company, regardless of size, uh, and where you're HQ'd, you know, needing that consistency as we we roll out business plans is really key. I um, completely agree with Frank and Clark, even as, even as an attorney, you know, some of these pieces of legislation are difficult to, to, to comprehend and especially as part of that bigger picture. But I think this is a really good forum, this and others, in order to have those direct conversations uh, with the lawmakers. Um, absolutely back, back Frank up to say if you're in the audience and you have some views, you know, make sure you're looking out for when you can raise your hand.
Um, I believe there were public consultations, certainly IBM responded to on the EU Data Act, you know, ongoing conversations on some of the other uh, puzzles in, in the picture. So, so use your voice for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point, you know, to have different uh, stakeholders in the conversation. But actually, I'm wondering, you know, because we all agree that, you know, it should be pretty easy and understandable to to the different players, you know, to use this and to actually, you know, get the benefits out of it. And do you have any ideas on how to make it more easy and understandable? Uh, is it just, you know, having the, the legal text, you know, like to be as clear as possible? Um, or is it some complementary measures? Because, you know, in, in different pieces of legislation we saw, you know, it depends if there is, I don't know, a board or, you know, if there are some companies that are leading the way in implementation. Um, any ideas on this? I mean, I could take just maybe one example. Let's just, if the whole point here is not, is to avoid the lock-in and to let you port your data or switch providers, then let's look at just that simple case. Um, and when I write, you know, if I want to right now change my search engine uh, based on uh, who is providing me with my browser, um, uh, you know, let's look at how many times I have to say, yes, I really, really, really want to switch. Uh, and I'm really sure I want to switch. And a day after I've switched, yes, I'm still sure with my choice. I don't want to go back. So think about all the things it, just in the consumer space. Um, all the sort of crazy hurdles and tricks you see when you want to just switch a pretty simple service. Uh, you know, please just move all of my browsing history over here. I'm ready for a new provider. So, I mean, let's just look at that one case and let's say, okay, let's set the goal that in five years, if somebody wants to uh, move to next cloud from a similar provider, uh, is it 43 clicks? Is it a lot of nudges to come back? Is it a lot of, are you really sure you want to do this? How simple is it? I mean, um, you know, it's going to, uh, every provider is going to have a different answer and say, well, of course, you know, I don't want you to accidentally move your entire enterprise to another thing with one wrong click. So, but I mean, I think we're going to, we're going to have to really just look at that in a few years and see like, is it possible to migrate without six months and hiring Accenture uh, or, you know, can I really do this? How simple is this going to be? Um, because that's the acid test. I mean, we have this golden ideal of competition is one click away. Um, but as we all know, with you know, with with um, uh, with Google and search, uh, competition is the one click, and I think twenty seven billion away. That's how much is annually spent to lock you into Google search uh, based on what they pay to the browsers and others. So, uh, um, so that's to me the test: is can we just take one simple use case? I want to switch providers and can we come back in three years after the data act has passed and say, can you, <laughs> and can you without, you know, uh, without a nightmare, that's going to be a really simple test. And, and we ought to try and devise some kind of set of things like that. Just very simple moves to, you know, to really live interoperability here. Um, and let's see if you really can do it in a few years. Yeah. I think this is an excellent point. I completely agree with Clark. We really need to um, make sure that it's really practical and easy, um, exactly without uh, hiring Accenture and have a, a billion uh, euro project. And of course, you could theoretically, but no one really can do it in, in reality. Uh, I think this is exactly a, a great point. I mean, we we all should remember, like one of the it sounds silly, but it's one of the great success stories of the European Union system. The enforcement of the portability of like phone numbers from one carrier to another and this sounds like from a technical and legal uh, perspective like as a tiny thing but for citizens it's, it's huge right and then uh, we really should look into into some real world examples of what we can do here it's a pain that a lot of people organizations companies have and um, regarding portability and access of data and uh, that we can solve it. Um, and that's just theoretically with hiring Accenture. I love that example. Um, but really, like really easily. Mm -hmm. no, I I mean, no, no harm to Accenture here, by the way. I just uh, just sprang to mind. But you, you all, everybody knows exactly what we what I mean when you say that. You know, it's like, do I can I do it with ten clicks and and my CTO gets it done, or is this going to be a project? 
Yeah, and I would just add to that, Paula, um, that we shouldn't lose the good work that we've done. It was great to see Pierre saying that they're going to continue to monitor, you know, projects such as Gaia X, but also industry led initiatives such as SWIPO. Um, you know, let's look to those broader work streams as this process plays out and engage those stakeholders as needed so that we're not reinventing the wheel on some of this but I think yeah education and awareness for us all would be good maybe we could collaborate on more of that um, I think that would be really helpful as this plays out yeah. and in, oh sorry go on Clark I was just going to throw a question to Anita because I'm so fascinated you know IBM you guys you know there's a great book called the big nine that essentially says there's only nine companies right now in the world that are going to be capable of sort of being a part of the AI market and IBM is one of the six from the US um, uh, and so I'm really fascinated, you know, AI runs on data and many of the competitors that are among those big nine are gigantic consumer companies. Right. They're sitting right. on top of gigantic amounts of consumer data that they've gathered from our mobile phones and other things. And you guys are, of course, at the enterprise level, but yeah. is there, uh, you know, we're talking, you know, even the data act is going to be separating devices and data. I'm just cu curious to do a different separation here and let's talk about AI and how it's going to interact with data sets because if like if there's somebody best positioned to be the company that can help let me say I bring my data set to you and somehow we anonymize it and you can somehow give me some AI based insights back without mm -hmm. really seeing that data set I know there's blockchain companies already that have been working on these things for a long time like the Ocean Protocol out of Berlin and others but I'm just curious is it something I'm sure IBM is way ahead of everybody in trying to think around the corner for this, how to bring AI and algorithmic services atop data sets, uh, but the twain shall not really meet, or we can stay GDPR compliant, I'm not sure, but I'd just be fascinated to hear where you guys weigh in on that, if you see great opportunity here, or if it's still too difficult to, to get to that service layer. <laughs> Well, I think it's great that you picked up on one of my first points, actually, where enterprise facing. Um, so we don't have those, you know, caches of consumer data. So certainly data access is important to IBM. Um, I think it was interesting also, Clark, that you mentioned COVID-19. I think one of the projects uh, we had was to use um, map data, I think, um, from approved um, public data to provide um, an app which you know you could see in your hometown what the cases were and, and so on so so definitely I think AI is a fascinating topic that crosses all sectors right it's there in health it's there in automotive it, it's just across all the sectors um, but for that in order to train models uh, we do need to to use data. Um, often the output, um, we don't output the data itself, right? It's um, value that's added on top of the data. But um, because that's such an important part of our strategy moving forward, along with hybrid cloud, uh, yes, it's it's a really interesting topic for us, data access in general. Um, I would say that uh, broadly, we look at a uh, a number of spheres for that certainly any legislation that can help uh, such as the EU, EU data act but I did point to some of the copyright directives as well um, great to see some of the opening up for text and data mining which is a tool used in AI solutions you know we're able to make use of that commercially that wasn't available in Europe before and it isn't available in the UK at the moment, interestingly. Um, but also, you know, looking at, at broader policy initiatives around data access. And I think, again, we've all mentioned open data. Um, granted that not all data under the Data Act is going to be available in that way. You know, it looks like it is going to be mixed data sets. It's not going to be purely open. But it would be great to see sort of more public sector data um, in non-personal data being made available in this way again with that kind of tr sort of trusted and um, you know tried set of licenses that we can just access and make use of um, so yes Clark I think it's a it's definitely an ongoing issue um, in a number of fields but particularly particularly with AI yeah, that's very interesting that we came back to AI because, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we did have a question on the AI Act. And I have to say that from my perspective, I just looked at the AI Act a bit more, you know, from this uh, ethical lens and not necessarily from a more 
um, you know, interoperability or data sharing perspective. But of course, it opens up so many, uh, so many possibilities. Um, but actually, when uh, when Clark, you talked about, you know, a simple experiment that could be done, you know, if the data act actually works in a couple of years. Um, I thought that Frank is going to jump on the on the topic, you know, how difficult it is, probably. Uh, that's my guess. Uh, for many uh, for many enterprises or also individual users to to switch to Nextcloud, for example, and like if you see it, you know, like for your company, do you see it, you know, like in the current state? Do you think that this is going to make it much more easy? Because you know, there is this provision that um, you know, like there has to be like thirty day support uh, and continuity of the uh, of the data services of the cloud services. Um, do you think that this can work? <laughs> 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 uh, one, one, one thing is, of course, that we haven't really touched uh, yet is um, what kind of data structure and service we are talking about, because there are there, there's a spectrum. There is like on one hand, there is something like files. Files is a data structure that exists like for whatever, 50, 60 years, there's a concept of a file, it has a name, it has some content, has a modification date, and that's it. And that's fully understood. You can call it open standard a file. <clears throat> and moving files around is easy. So moving files from one cloud service to another is like super easy. Uh, and we can do that. Um, on the other hand, you have like really um, like extremely complicated data structures like, I don't know, let's say, uh, the TikTok social network, right? Which is like you have videos, you have likes, you have friends, you have a social graph, you have like messages, you have all kinds of things. And switching this kind of data model from one provider to another, let's say you want to switch from, I don't know, what's a TikTok competitor? I don't know, TikTok one to TikTok two. That's not possible, right? And this is not something that unfortunately can actually not solved with open standards because this is it's not possible to have an open standard because this is this market is developing so fast. Basically, there's new features and functionalities pop up like by the day. And it's a, it would be a utopia to have some kind of common standards of, to make it portability between these kinds of systems. And with Nextcloud, that, that's what you ask. We have the same challenge. We have switching like your files from uh, OneDrive or Google Drive to Nextcloud, that's super easy. Migrating your contacts and your calendar data and your email, it's a bit harder, but it's also that's also possible because there are open standards for this kind of data structures. But then moving your Teams conversation over from Teams or Slack to Nextcloud Talk, that's like super hard because like the, the functionality of these different services are not even the same. So um, I don't know, maybe on, 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 on Teams, you can like a message and in Slack, you cannot like a message, but you have a threaded view and the other one is not. So basically there's no real data portability even possible. So um, that's a bit of a, of a challenge there. Mm -hmm. Which also, point to the, uh, also points to the fact that, you know, I mean, even though we have so many provisions of data sharing in the Data Act, it will very much depend on the type of data, which, you know, we all, mentioned quite uh, quite a bit of times um so i'm very curious to see how you know how the discussions are going to follow and you know just like what the different types of companies and just platforms are going to uh to respond to this but of course it's also addressed in the other files such as the dsa and the dma so again you know going to the idea that you know it's a bit of a complicated landscape when you you know after all um but as we are slowly, uh, slowly going to the end of the event, um, I would like to um, ask you for a small, I wouldn't say rundown or a summary, but more, you know, just a couple of thoughts that you think are the most important and the topics that are the most important that you think that our audience should be left with after this event. You know, it could be questions, it could be the topics that, uh, that we should, uh, you know, maybe give a bit more thought to. Um, and maybe let's um, let's start with Clark, if you if you are ready. Sure. Yeah. Thanks so much, Paula, and thanks to uh, to Pierre, who's not here, but also to Frank and Anita and Paula, you for really a fascinating discussion and also a lot of great questions from from um, 
the men and women that have been typing them. Uh, thanks also to you for listening in and and um, putting in your two cents. Um, I'd maybe uh, maybe just sort of echo something that came up towards the end of the of the discussion, and then maybe make one uh, sort of other uh, related plea. But I think the the you know speaking on behalf of uh, we're we're a think tank that was founded by people from the European digital space, um, and so as a result, you know we're always listening to stakeholders that are operating in the market, um, and as I had mentioned, you know we have GDPR now, and we're soon going to have. DMA, DSA, AI Act, Data Act, uh, Everything Act. Um, and so if I could just make a plea for all of the legislators, uh, and, and, and today's event is sort of a great example of doing it, um, especially being able to hear um, Anita and Frank really from the front lines, um, I would just hope that the legislators re think about the end of how things are going to be applied, how things are going to be lived, because it's really easy you know in the laboratory to say we're going to design a great piece of legislation and it's going to work with these four others across the way um, but to really think about how these things are going to be lived by a small business or a mid-sized business or a hyperscaler um, i think it's just so important because as we've seen with gdpr everybody who's working in the european digital space came up with a long list of things that you could do to improve it a little, not throw it away, but improve it. Uh, and the parliament was simply not interested in even having that debate three years on, uh, even though you know some of the members of parliament published their list of you know 30 suggestions for how to fix GDPR. So I, I think all those of us who are, who are in the digital space now um, are excited about the possibilities of legislation like Data Act and other things that are coming, we we see the possibilities for innovation and new markets that can be created with positive regulation, but we also see the danger of things that uh, lock us into bad situations and then don't get fixed for a decade. So I guess my plea is, dear, dear people who might not be on the on the call right now, but um, that those in power who are crafting these pieces of legislation really think long and hard about how it's going to be lived, how it's going to be enforced, how it's going to be implemented. Is there any remedy if it's not working well? Who do who do we call when it's not working? Please think of these things. Yeah. Who do we call? Yeah, that, that's a very, <laughs> yeah, I thank you. Um, thank you, Frank. Yeah, um, I think most was said already. I think it's, uh, it's a huge opportunity, it's a huge chance um for for your for competitive market um but the details are are important um uh, the details are important and i really hope that um that um that yeah, the process will work in a way that a lot of feedback is still like put into the act um because it has the potential to become like a yeah, a failure basically, uh, or a real success story. And uh, yeah, as Clark said, I uh, hope that uh, more input is like uh, is like um, looked at um, compared to the, the GDPR process. Okay, thank you. And uh, Anita, your your thoughts? You know, like what what should we take out of this event? Uh, the one thing I would say is please use your voice. You know, even for me, I've been discussing these issues internally, but it's been so nice to hear from other people today and I've learned today. So use your voice and, um, you know, see this as a positive time, guys. I mean, what a time to be in legal tech or policy with data, AI, cybersecurity. Um, and I would also say to the audience um, to use your responsibility to, to train, you know, skill and upskill a new generation of talent in these fields. I think the future is bright. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, such a positive note uh for the ending um and having said that uh thank you everyone for joining us today uh of course especially to our speakers it was a pleasure to have you here um i think we'll have you know some more events in the future on this and maybe in three years as clark uh, you know through the <laughs> idea you know i think we can organize actually yeah it's been three years since the previous event 
on the cloud. So now, you know, we can we can establish it as a, as a three <laughs> every three year uh, event or maybe earlier. Um, but thank you so much. And I hope that you uh, that you enjoyed uh, enjoyed the time that you spent with us today. Uh, and having said that, uh, also, I would like to invite you to join our next event that is happening on 23 March. And it also starts at 4 p.m. Uh, Brussels time. And there we will discuss the increased attention on the digital autonomy and the concerns that, you know, regard, you know, topics that basically we touched upon today, um, but also the user control of IT infrastructures and, you know, the whole idea of the open strategic autonomy. And I can say what is quite interesting and I'm really looking forward to it. We will publish a paper on the same topic and it will be published uh, this, the day of the event. Uh, so I hope that, you know, we can continue the conversation and, you know, just uh, let's stay in touch. Uh, so thank you, everyone, uh, and enjoy your evening, afternoon, uh, wherever you are and joining us from. Um, and see you next week, hopefully. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Paula. Bye-bye. Thank you.